Coming up... I think one thing that can keeps me wanting to keep making things is I like to make things that I haven't done before. I like to keep pushing myself to create new things. Explore the inspiration behind the contemporary and traditional designs of textile artist Kenny Glass. And we go foraging for the Cherokee delicacy, Wishy. It's kind of secretive whenever you find one because it's you hold it personal and you don't dare tell anybody about it. And from the days of Indian Territory to the modern-day Cherokee Nation Reservation, learn more about the Cherokee Marshal Service. The badge is one facet of a marshal. It's a community volunteer. It's a community advocate. It's helping the nation build a nation. Plus, Catherine Brown contributed to creating a network of supporters for the Cherokees during a very pivotal time. Learn about the determination and heartbreak that made Catherine Brown one of the most well-known Native American writers of the 19th century. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Welcome to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, capital city of the Cherokee Nation. For generations, the Cherokee story has been told by others. Today, through this groundbreaking series, we're taking ownership of our own story and telling it as beautifully and authentically as we can. I hope you enjoy these profiles of our people, our history, and our culture. And please make plans to come visit us sometime. What else? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the John Ross Museum in Park Hill, Oklahoma. Here you can learn more about education and the vital role it's played throughout Cherokee history. We'll have more on that coming up a little bit later in our Cherokee Almanac. But first, Kenny Glass is a Cherokee textile artist creating unique designs that are true to his style. Contemporary, one of a kind, using bold colors and traditional patterns. I think one thing that can keeps me wanting to keep making things is I like to make things that I haven't done before. I like to keep pushing myself to create new things. And I don't want to just keep creating the same thing over and over. I want to keep pushing, seeing how far I can go. My name is Kenny Glass, and I am a textile artist, and I enjoy mixing traditional and contemporary designs. I've kind of been interested in art most of my life. So when I got into college I, over at Bacon, I learned to bead there. It was about 2013 is when I first started sewing. My mom and my grandma both sew, and a friend of mine and my mom showed me how to work the sewing machine, and I kind of just hit the ground running from there. I make a lot of stomp dance skirts mostly is, is what I started with, and I gave a lot of them to the girls at our stomp grounds and my friends that shook shells and stuff people would kind of start asking me if, if, um, to make them skirts every now and then, and so I started selling them after that. It's important to me just because it kind of um, helps me, you know, feel like I'm contributing to our culture, you know, and just keeping it going. I get a lot of um, people that want skirts also just for casual wear, you know, it, it kind of represents who they are, um, whatever tribe they can make them from. The person wearing it, it makes them feel like they're being true to themselves as well. There were times that someone might ask me if I can make them something just like something that they saw me make, and I really don't like to do that. It's like, I like to keep things personal to each person, and you know, I just don't want them to feel like someone else has the same thing that they got. I have a stomp dance skirt that's in the new Cherokee National History Museum, um, the old courthouse, and um, there's a section up there that talks about the community, and um, there's a little bit about stomp dance in there. I made the skirt that's in there, as well as I designed the t-shirt as well that's on the mannequin. And then I have um, some work at the at the new casino for the Nancy Ward outfit. I did her, her clothing as well. 
Some of the work that I do is a mix of, you know, um, traditional things with a, like a modern twist or contemporary designs put into them. You know, there's times when I made like the 1800s style clothing, like I put more contemporary things on them um, or designs in them as well, or even made them out of different materials that they wouldn't have been made back then. You know, when I create things that have different designs in them, you know, tricky designs, I think one reason why it's important to me to do that is like, you know, somebody that may be unfamiliar with certain designs or certain, you know, stories or parts of culture that they'll see those designs and, you know, they'll ask questions, you know, they'll ask, you know, you know what it means. And that's, I feel like that's just a door um, to be able to open and, you know, tell them about it and, you know, share with some, share something with them they may not, may not have known, and known before that. I love Cherokee baskets and I like to look at them and I like the designs in them. So I, you know, I like to, you know, put those designs on fabrics or ribbons and um, put that into my work to kind of represent different parts of our culture as well as like different designs as well. Today I'm going to be working on um, a, a little boy's vest that's going to match a bandolier bag that I have made and um, it's going to be black and gold and it has um, a Cherokee basket pattern which is like these hearts the chief's heart design on there and um, I did it on the bag as well and um, I kind of want them to match each other. I was hoping one of my nephews could wear it because they really um, are proud to wear stuff that I make for them so I was hoping that one of them would wear it. A lot of the times my ideas they all come from different places and um, I am inspired by being around some of my friends that I'm with like um, I'm friends with a lot of Cherokee artists here, and um, a lot of times we'll bounce ideas off of each other and we'll get inspired. Um, in 2016, I got to be a part of um, an art show. It was in Tulsa. Um, it was about Native stereotypes, and um, America Meredith was the one that curated that, and she asked me to be a part of that. And, and so I, I created this princess-style dress. It was kind of a Cinderella-style dress, and. Um, that was a response to, you know, when I went to Bacon, there was a lot of different Native students there, and um, they started making jokes about, you know, everybody says that they're Cherokee, you know, everybody wants to be Cherokee, and the dress that I made was um, in response to that, you know, it was called my great-grandmother's Cherokee princess dress, and um, so it did did look like a Cinderella dress, and it had um, Cherokee basket designs in, in the skirt and in the top as well. It was in a way therapeutic to kind of put all that into one piece. Austin. Right now, I am a few weeks into the Cherokee Language Master Apprentice Program. Um, in, in this program, there's nine of us in our group, and we're coming into a learning environment where we're surrounded by the Cherokee language all day long, and our teachers are fluent speakers from different communities, and they're wanting to give us this knowledge to keep the language going, and we're losing speakers as we go on. You know, a lot of the speakers are older in age, and so, like, we're losing them, you know, as time goes by, and so they're what we're, we're, they're trying to do in this program is to create new speakers to keep going. And, you know, they also want to create teachers as well, people that will can, you know, finish this program and, and go on and continue to teach the language. And this is something I'm really excited about because, you know, I've always heard, you know, that, you know, we can't have our culture without our language. So, like, that's something that I'm excited to mesh together. Okay. One reason to me personally, like why it's important to preserve our culture and, and our language as well, which I think they go hand in hand is, um, you know, for the, the next generations that come because, you know, not everybody has the privilege of growing up connected to their culture. And there's a lot of people, you know, that their families may have moved away or, and, and then so they grow up very disconnected. You know, our community and our culture, you know, makes us who we are. And so it's important that we you know, are able to keep that going for the next generation to come. When I make things for people, whether they ask me to or if I give things to people, you know, one thing that I, I just hope is that they'll use it. I would much rather see someone out there wearing something I made rather than just seeing them hang it on the wall or hang it in their closet or something like that. It just makes me happy to see other people happy with it. As far as my art goes, I just hope to keep continue making things and just because it's something I enjoy, you know, I, if it was different where like this was something I had to do to make money to survive, I don't know that I would love it as much. So like, I just hope this is something I can continue to find joy in and to keep going in the future with it.
Here in the Cherokee Nation, fall brings cooler temperatures and a hint of excitement, as it's the season that brings us a mushroom called wishy, a coveted delicacy amongst our people. Wishy. Wishy is a type of mushroom. In English, some people call it a hen of the woods or a sheep's head. In Japanese, it's a mayatake mushroom. Its Latin name is Grifola frondosa. Fancy. Wishy is its Cherokee name. And here in the Cherokee Nation, wishy is not just a delicacy, it's part of a cherished foraging tradition passed on by our elders. See you. To learn the proper way to forage for and cook wishy, we knew exactly who to learn from, Loretta Shade. Osio. Osio. How are you? Fine, and you? Good. That's good. good. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. And this is Katie, Katie? my granddaughter. Hi, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, too. Loretta Shade is not only a grandmother, she's a Cherokee national treasure, a first language Cherokee speaker, an educator, and a culture keeper. You guys ready to look for some mushrooms? Sure. All right. First things first, let's forage. We're going south here, down by the creek. That's where we uh, usually find them. This is the fall or the season for wishy. What kind of tree it's, is that? That's, that's a white a oak tree. White oak tree. You know, you see there's several white oak trees here, but you know, not everyone will have a, a mushroom, and it's just kind of a, kind of a secluded to. You know, one every now and then. The ones that find the mushrooms are just kind of secretive whenever you find one because it's you hold it personal and you don't dare tell anybody about it. It's probably in a dark spot uh -huh. and where the leaves are real moist. Uh -huh. That's how they grow. There's one right there, Katie. She's learned how to clean around it, make sure she doesn't cut the root off. If you don't cut the root off of it, it'll grow back again next season. She's very careful. We learn from our elders, whatever uh, traditions that we know or customs was taught by our elders. And this is just one of the ways that we've been taught. This is the little one compared to what we have found. Okay, this one had a stick in it. I just took it out. When Larry was here, he must, he's put a stick in it so it'll grow. And what you do is tell it to grow whenever you get ready to leave, you say, I get all the hot I'll come back and get you. And you're t asking it to grow. So you, you think and ask with everything that you, you know, hunt and find in, in the Cherokee way. Now that we have foraged our wishi, it's time to clean them. So th this is how you clean mushroom. You make sure there's not any leaves, roots, bugs. So this is the most time consuming of mushrooms. So is there a certain size you want them to be? Just nope, just bite size. Just bite size. Because you're going to wash them several times. Looks like our Wishi enjoyed their bath. Look how clean they are. And now it's time to cook them. Aha. You make sure they're thoroughly floured so you can get them either crispy or you can get them soft, chewable consistency. Salt and pepper them down really good. About whatever you think, what, you know, the side is, that side is crispy. You turn them over or stir them up. Oops. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. Okay, let's have the food bless. We always have food blessing before we eat. Okay. 
ist deski näha og gi og gi gi stort eller helig. Deski at han hisse stod du jukte gi til gi sa i. To hi gi sa i. Hvad da? Amen. Time to eat our wishy. Jeffrey, take a bite. All right. I'm excited. Mmm. That's delicious. They are good. Mm-hmm. They are cooked perfectly. So there you have it. The Cherokee hunt for wishy and full happy bellies. Donadago ha'i. In the early 19th century, Cherokee people strove to understand the culture of encroaching white settlers. In this Cherokee almanac, we learn the story of a young woman named Catherine Brown and how she navigated those uncertain times. Catherine Brown contributed to creating a network of supporters for the Cherokees during a very pivotal time. She really was a trailblazer. It had to have taken a lot of bravery for her because she was stepping out from generations of tradition. In 1817, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions established the Brainerd Mission School in the Cherokee town of Chickamauga, present-day Chattanooga, Tennessee. A 17-year-old Cherokee named Catherine Brown was one of the mission's earliest students. Catherine Brown was born around the year 1800 near the Cherokee village of Creek Path. The missionaries were excited that a young woman from a prominent Cherokee family was interested in attending. Part of the project of the missionary schools was really to remake gender roles in the Cherokee nation. But again, in having to interact with missionaries who had very different ideas about what it meant to be a woman, Catherine Brown worked within the conduits that became available to her. Catherine soon began to pray with her fellow students and assisted in teaching the Lord's Prayer to the younger girls in the school. At the time, writing letters was a very valued form of literacy, especially for women in Euro-American culture. Catherine's baptism and writing proficiency were points of pride for the missionaries, and her written letters were sent to benefactors in New England as proof of the value in their work. But oh, my dear sister, how many of our brethren and sisters are yet in darkness, living without God and without hope in the world? They have precious and immortal souls to be lost or saved. As Catherine wrote these letters, they were very treasured by their recipients. Many of them began to be printed in newspapers at the time. Interestingly, she became almost a celebrity figure for these Christians in the Northeast. Catherine Brown's conversion to Christianity and the popularity of her writing was likely held up as evidence that Cherokee people, specifically Cherokee women, could become domesticated and therefore civilized. So there is this kind of insidiousness in, in that kind of designation and that appellation being applied to any group of indigenous people because there's this notion of a model minority. But unfortunately, I believe that her conversion was used strategically to try and send a message to, to other Cherokee people that if they could behave in as respectable a manner, that they would be treated better than they were. In 1820, the success of a boys' mission school in Creek Path created a demand by the community for a girls' school to be built as well. Catherine was proposed as a teacher for the girls' school, and this was very enthusiastically received by the residents of Creek Path. Catherine found fulfillment teaching in her hometown and being near her family. But it wasn't long before her brother fell ill and Catherine went with him to water. She participated in some rituals of healing uh, for her brother's health that tend to have um, you know, quite a bit of resonance within Cherokee culture. Even at the same time as she was very much engaging in Christian religious practices that she was being taught by the missionaries. 
Her brother eventually passed away, and soon Catherine began to display similar symptoms. She was taken to Huntsville, Alabama, and was treated for a few weeks before succumbing to her illness at the age of 23. Two years after her death in 1825, a missionary named Rufus Anderson compiled her letters and diary into a memoir. It was immensely popular and was reprinted many times and in multiple languages. It's possible to speculate that the representation of Catherine Brown was one of the most widely circulated representations of a Native American woman in the 19th century. At the very least, she exhibited a strength that is absolutely there in all Cherokee women. Let's talk Cherokee. I am eating. I am eating. Two of us are eating. Two of us are eating. A group of us are eating. A group of us are eating. The Cherokee Marshal Service is our tribe's law enforcement agency with jurisdiction throughout the Cherokee Nation. But their call to duty often goes beyond law enforcement, providing services to our Cherokee communities. The Cherokee Nation has always been a nation of laws. Through its inception before the United States was the United States, the Cherokee Nation thrived on laws and the pursuit of laws and pursuit of education. In 1989, we had the Ross v. Neff decision come out of the Tenth Circuit. And what Ross v. Neff said what it was is, the state has no criminal jurisdiction on Indian country involving Native Americans. Therefore, the tribe had to decide, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna bring in the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the FBI to patrol our lands? Or do we revamp our law enforcement, our department? Bring it back. We wrote our tribal codes. We started the tribal court system all the way up through the Tribal Supreme Court and also started what is today the Marshal Service. That was the first watershed event in Eastern Oklahoma for Indian sovereignty. The second came with McGurk. The summer 2020 will go down, in, in my opinion, in history as a watershed event from the Supreme Court. The McGurk decision fundamentally changed the definition of Indian country in Eastern Oklahoma. It changed what it is to be a tribe and have your sovereignty. We're on the cutting edge of sovereignty. There's nothing more fundamental about sovereignty than, than being able to enforce law on, their, on your own citizens. For us to be able to do that as a tribe speaks volumes for the stance of sovereignty that this tribe has, and we hold that very dear. So if you look at our agency, we're just like any modern-day police agency. We have a patrol division that they wear uniforms, they drive marked patrol cars. We answer calls just like a normal police officer would. And we also have a special operations team. Uh, you'd look at it like a SWAT team. My special operations team, the SWAT team part of it, has approximately 50 to 60 activations a year. That goes everywhere from high-risk warrant, arm and barricaded gunmen, to hostage rescue. So we, we spread the gamut of what we can do. We have a dive team, we have a SAR team, search and rescue team. So those are two different things. The Swift Water team is a rescue element of the Marshal Service. When I first started uh, August 13th of 2000, my nation number, my call sign for the radio was uh, Nation Nine. So I was the ninth marshal at the time, a very, very small organization. And we've 
move from nine marshals up to 31. We covered the historical boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. 14 counties, that chunk of land is our historical boundaries. And that's where we have primary Indian country jurisdiction within those 14 counties. We also hold approximately 56, 58 cross deputizations with state, county, district attorney's offices, local uh, police departments that allow us to operate as that police officer would normally. We will help local, county, and city officers and also take calls in Indian country as our primary duties. Nation 3, Adair County. Go ahead, Nation 3. County, uh, where's your officers at at this time, uh, subjects that are detained with? We put in place across deputizations with these local law enforcement agencies to help us to have a faster response time out in Indian country, and that works out a lot as a partnership. The, these guys right here are cross-deputized too. They're just like me. Because we don't know in the middle of the night if, if I go to a, respond to a call in an isolated area, if it's state land or tribal land. All we know is we gotta get to it. For example, like a domestic, we gotta get there because it's a life or death situation in some circumstances. It's good to get out in these rural communities where you meet these people and kind of let them know that, you know, they do have law enforcement no matter how rural the area is. There is somebody out there kind of there for them if they need help and we are available uh, for anything they might need. A lot of our citizens out there, especially our elders, folks that live in these isolated areas, they have no one to go to. And if you need to lend a hand, a service, anything that you can do out there, you're going to be appreciated a little bit more. That's the true meaning of, of tribal law enforcement, is to help and provide services for those citizens out there. When you ask a marshal, if, if you'd ask, go out in the hall and ask, hey, what do you do? There, none of them will say, I work at the marshal service. All of them will say, I am a marshal. It's who they are. It's a pride thing. It's taking care of our own. It's taking care of our people. It's taking care of our culture, our community, our existence in this country. The badge is one facet of a marshal. It's a community volunteer, it's a community advocate, it's helping the nation build a nation. But I think it's incredibly important that our marshals understand the heritage and traditions of the Cherokee Nation. To know where you're going as an individual or an organization, you have to know where you've been. You have to remember why we're doing what we're doing, that this is a heritage. We have 12 officers on the Federal Memorial Wall that gave their life to serve their tribe. So that lineage continues. Hoa. We hope you enjoyed our show and remember you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dodadago ha'i. Wado.